What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Thoughts of the Pugilist podcast. I'm your host, Vlad Bayzid, and today's pugilist is the one and only, the Iceman, John Scully. Mr. John, Mr. Scully, yes, thanks sir. for coming on the show. Yeah. I appreciate your time. So how are you enjoying Montreal? I love Montreal. You know, I've been coming here for many years, since 1988. So uh, I've, I've gotten to know it very well. Many, I have many friends here. I, I love Montreal. So you're in Montreal this time yeah. for uh, Arthur Betterbiev's uh, training camp. Right, right, right. And um, I mean, how, how's, how's that going? He's Arthur, you know. He's he's uh, he's training hard. He's he's focused, and uh, you know I, I really like the training camps with him. Mark Ramsey's his head coach, and the way he does things, uh, you know, you're very involved. And you know, like like I've been to a lot of training camps with guys where, quite honestly, they don't really do that much. Mm. They, you know, they spar, they hit the bag, you know, and they jump rope and they go home, you know. But we, you know, we work on things, details, and Arthur's very focused, and it's a very strenuous and single-minded training camp so I uh, keeps you keeps you engaged mm. and you know I like as a trainer I like that a lot wow yeah. I see yeah now I know you can't say what exactly you're working on yeah but uh, can you give us a prediction for the art fight I mean I always just say with everybody with everyone he fights I just say 12 rounds is a long time to be in there with this man he puts pressure on so sometimes in a subtle manner, sometimes obvious, but it's really, really hard to stay with this guy mentally mm. 12 rounds, you know? Um, I mean, I mean, I, I can't see him losing, you right. know, if that's what you mean. Uh, I would assume he's going to break Yard down and stop him probably in, you know, late, in middle, middle rounds, like okay. four to seven, four to, five, four okay. to eight, okay. you know, whatever. Uh, you know, he's, 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 uh, he's, you know, he's the best light heavyweight in the world at this point. And, and not just for, you know, not just he's the best, but I mean, he's the strongest. Mm. He's the hardest punching. You know, he's got so many things on his side. Does, um, does working with a guy like Arthur make your job easier? It does because he, 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 he keeps you on your toes. Like, mm. like he keeps you on, on your toes more than most other fighters because he wants you engaged. He wants you paying attention. He wants okay. you telling him what he's doing. But by the same token, he's a guy you don't have to watch. You don't, you know, you don't have to make sure. Oh, make sure you do your sit-ups. Like that would be that would be an insult if you told him, ah, make sure you do your sit-ups. He, you know, he would be insulted. Like he he knows to do his sit-ups. He knows everything that he has to do. Right. You don't yeah. have to shop around. Nah, around. Never. 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 Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, a quote that, I, that you said in a, in a, I think you posted it somewhere on Instagram. Yeah. But um, you said boxing is the ultimate truth teller. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For what, sure. What does that mean? Okay. You get a guy and he tells you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that to you. Mm. Okay, well, we'll see. Like you get in that ring, how many guys? Like, here's think about this. Nobody ever thinks about this. Say there's a hundred fights, right? Before a hundred fights, two hundred guys, two for each fight, are going to tell everyone in the world what they're going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Da, 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 right? Well, one hundred of them are going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. They're going to be wrong. They're going to be proven wrong. No matter how much they sounded like they were confident and sure of themselves. They're wrong because mm. the truth comes out in the ring. You know, you can say, you could tell me all these things you're going to do. I say, well, we'll see. <laughs> you might not. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, it might not be as easy as you think it is. Or I might hit you with a right hand and all of a sudden your whole plan goes out the window. You know, people talk about, I would fight Tyson for a million dollars. I've had a hundred people in my life say, I would fight Mike Tyson for a million dollars. I see. You wouldn't get out of the dressing room. You'd be in the dressing room and you would hear him hitting the pads down the hall and you would say, keep your money. I don't want your money. I don't want your money. <laughs> value my and that's the truth. And I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. And uh, I've seen guys tell me what they're going to do with me, sparring. Mm. I had a guy less than a year ago. He's like 23 years old. I'm, I was 54 at the time. And he's 23. And he's telling me, 
oh, you, you're not that good. And I can do, I'll do this. I said, well, I said, we can spar if you want. I got gloves. I got this kid. This is a kid from Hartford. You know, he's like 20, I'm guessing 23 years old. He's not a fighter, is he? Yeah, yeah. He, he was getting ready to turn pro. Okay. And he's telling me, you know, like he's talking crazy with me, right? So I said, you know what? I said, we could get in the ring right now. I won't even try. I won't even try hard and I'll make you quit. I promise you, you'll quit before me. <laughs> I would never quit before you. That's the reality. And he got offended. Right. And we did it. And he quit. <laughs> he quit after the sixth round. And I told him, I stopped with like 30 seconds to go in the sixth round. I said, hey, everybody, this is his last round. I could see, I could see his body language. Right. And that's what I mean. I could see his truth. His truth was written all over his face and his body. And I told him, I said, you're going to quit after this round. There's no way you do another round with me. And he did. Wow. And he did. I may have convinced him to do it. I, right, right, but right. I'm that sure was, that, that, but that was his truth. It wasn't my truth. It was his truth. Mm. And that's what the ring is. What do you, how much, how much uh, of the result of the fight can you tell based on how someone's acting in the locker room? It's, it's, it's indicative. Uh, you know, you see, cause, because especially if you see a guy like for, for six weeks, He's Muhammad Ali. He's mm. telling you all the stuff he's going to do. And he's signing autographs and he's taking pictures and he's writing all over Instagram and how great he is, right? And then in the dressing room, he looks like he's going to the electric chair. Mm. And you say to yourself, you're not the same guy you were two weeks ago. You're dis two weeks ago, maybe you, you might do something. But tonight, I, don't, I think you've, that's why the dressing room, and I speak about the dressing room weight often, right? Because people don't really, if you've never done it, oh, man. The, you the dressing have room's to amazing. understand, right? Yeah. It's like, no matter how brave you think you are, right? Like, I, and I always give this example. You get two guys, guys hit me, I fight all the time. I go, nah, you fight in the street, you fight in a bar, that's different. Yeah. I go, I don't care who you, if I'm in a, in an, and I'm not a bar guy, I don't go to bars, but I'm saying a guy in a bar, Guy bumps into him, the guy's three inches taller than him, 40 pounds heavier, he bumps into him, they get into it, they fight. They fight because they have to, because the adrenaline is high, it's the spur of the moment. Mm. So they go, yeah, I fight. I go, you fought because you had to. Mm. Now, how about if I stop you guys right there in the bar, and I go, hey, I want you to go home for two days, I want you to think about what's gonna happen, come back here in two days and then fight. You know who's coming back? Nobody. Nobody. They're not coming, back. coming back. No, yeah. they're gonna. Common sense is gonna overrule everything. Boxing in a fight. Think about it. Boxing another guy for money in front of millions of people, hoping you don't get knocked out and hoping you knock him is not natural. It's no. not normal. That's not human behavior. You know, that's animalistic. Yeah. That's not for everybody. There's people who, like I say, people say, I fight my Tyson for a million dollars. I say, you wouldn't. No, you, you wouldn't. wouldn't. You, you think you would because you know you're not going to have to. I can tell you I'll fight Lennox Lewis, man, anytime. Oh, yeah, well, Lennox is in the room. He's coming out right now. Uh, yeah, um, uh, my stomach. <laughs> my yeah, stomach. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you say it because you know you're not going to have to yeah. do it. You know, so they get in the ring. In the reality, you're not as tough as you thought you were. Yeah. But, I mean, all fighters have to work through that, right? Because, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I'm not fighting on these guys' levels at all. But um, the, the few times that I... That I Anyway, I remember being in the, in, in the dressing room and I can't move my legs. Yeah, I can't yeah, move yeah, my yeah. jaw. I can't talk properly. When, when I was coming up as an amateur, I remember, I remember the day. I remember exactly where I was sitting. And I remember who said it. I was in the dressing room and I must have had a look on my face. I was trying to navigate this new feeling, right? And a kid named Patrick Ireland, he was much more experienced than I was at the time. And he came over to me and he goes, the day of the fight, you ever... You ever break your shoelace and you think that means you're gonna lose? And I went, yeah. He goes, everybody thinks that. He goes, everybody does that. What you're going through, he knew I was going through it. He could tell by my face. And he said, everybody goes through that. It's just a matter of hiding it. You're not hiding it yet, <laughs> you know? So all you gotta do is hide it. Yeah, you gotta, you know, you gotta deal with it. You, you know, you can't be like, like, like you see people, Say you're going through a bad neighborhood, right? Everybody knows this is the worst neighborhood in the city. Some guys walk and they, and they, they yeah, tense they, up. Yeah. 
Other guys just walk through like they've they've lived there their whole lives. Right. You got to be that guy. You got to you got to portray that to the people there, because if you show that meekness, you're getting mugged. Yeah. <laughs> you're getting mugged yeah. any minute. So it's it's all in the way you carry yourself, because on the inside everybody's dealing with. Mike Tyson of all people, the ultimate predator. He said, he's, you can look on YouTube, he talks about the same thing I'm saying. He said, man, I'm, I'm scared to death in this restroom. Right. I can't believe it. I'm scared to death. But then I walk out and all of a sudden I feel like a monster, yeah. you know, once I get there. Some people walk out and they still feel scared to death. I, I sure, yeah. yeah. I, I, my first fight, actually, um, I didn't know what was happening. Yeah, right, I was right, always right. a tough kid. Of course. And I puked right before the oh, fight. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Of course. That's, yeah. that's, and that's, that's you, you'd be amazed how many people do that that you wouldn't think do that. Tough guys, yeah. champions, and they're, you know, and they're telling you, man, I was scared to death. Well, how was Better Biev in there? <laughs> he's not worried about anything. Oh, really? <laughs> no, no, he's unusual. Like Roy Jones, James Tony, that's a different breed. That's a different mentality. These right. guys don't, they're not scared of anything. You know, they, they, uh, it's just different, you know? You, you know, for Better Biev's case, you told me that uh, you think his religion has a lot to do with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I believe he's, you know, a lot of people say they're Muslim, right? Yeah. And I think they say it to sound cool. Yeah, Islam, you know, but they still smoke cigarettes. They still drink wine, you know. Arthur is a Muslim, 150%. He follows it yeah. 100%. He lives by it. And I believe that's what gives him the strength, the focus, like the tunnel vision. You know, he's the, the, the ideal model of the religion. He's wow. what it's supposed to be, you know. And he's 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 a beast, man. He's he's focused, and uh, and and I believe that's from his upbringing in the religion. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Well, suppose you have a guy that that's not, you know, uh, mentally strong and and you know just super dedicated like yeah. Arthur. Yeah. Um, like say say you have an insecure fighter. Yeah. How do you make that guy more confident? You know, more it, uh, willing it, to fight. And it all takes that? time. It, there's little things that happen and it takes time, you know? And uh, like, I had a kid one time, super athlete. This mm. kid could fly, right? He, was, he could fly like Superman. He could run, he could do everything. But mentally, he would get distracted, easy, like super easily. He got so distracted one time, we were running stairs and he was running the stairs and I was at the bottom of the stairs talking to another fighter and he came down and he stopped running. He was supposed to run for a minute and he stopped and he started screaming and he's, you guys are talking and you're, you're taking my concentration away. So I got so mad, we got face to face, like mm. face to face, like gonna really go at it. And, uh, and I verbally like abused him. Right. I told him who he, I said, you're a punk, you're a coward. You have no focus whatsoever. You're never, I don't care how fast you can run, you can jump, you can fly, you can do all these things. It's gonna mean nothing. Look at you, you can't even focus on a one minute run up a stairs because we're have a conversation you're letting that deter you so I say you need to conquer this or you're gonna you're wasting everybody's time a couple weeks later guy comes in the gym 280 pounds this kid weighed 168 the kid I'm talking about the guy was 280 pounds he was 16 years old um, I can't say his name but right. he ended up being famous to a degree he's okay. a major he's a sports star okay you see him on TV every boxer no okay different sport but he's a monster so he comes in I don't know why he said it but he's like oh who wants to box and everybody's like, nah, you know, even the boxers are like, nah, nah we're good, you know? Right. So right away, I told my friend, I said, go get Mo. Mo was on the basketball court. I said, go get Mo, tell him to come in here. Tell him, tell him to say he wants to spar. She comes in, he's like, uh, who wants to spar? So the big boy's like, I spar. And everybody said, nah, 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 too small, too small. And he's like, and this, but this kid, one thing this kid had, he would fight. He would fight anybody. He'd fight Tyson, he'd fight anybody. And, and he's, nah, we're good, we're good, we're good. So. So this was a smaller kid. Than he's outweighed by 100 pounds. Okay. And he's got seven inches at least height disadvantage. 
So we glove up, and I tell him, I say, listen, I want you to go the whole first round. Don't worry about this guy. If you keep your hands up, his size is not going to mean anything. Right. Keep your hands up, and just the first round, I just want you to suck him in and wear him down. Mm. So he does that. And the kid kind of surprised me. Big, big boy actually had a jab where I almost thought he had boxing experience, you know, but I don't know if he did or not. But so by the end of the round, um, I see the big boys getting tired. So when the round ends, he comes back to the corner. My guy comes back to the corner. I said, listen, I know boxing. I know human beings. I know people. He's going to come out because everybody's here. Because by that time, 100 people had come right. into the gym to watch this. Okay. I said, He's gonna come out as hard as he can. He's gonna try and get you out of there because he's, he's got nothing left and he knows he doesn't. Yeah. But he's, he's gotta do it because all these people are here. I said, when I yell, get him Mo, that means he's done. That means he spent it right, all. Right. So sure enough, kid comes out, boom, 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 boom. And then he steps back and he goes. <sighs> and I could see the, the energy just from his face. And I was like, Get him, Mo. And he, my guy, it's like a movie. He comes right. out, he hits him with the right hand, turned his head, he hit him with the hook, boom. The big boy, it was like when King Kong fell off the World Trade Center. <laughs> it was like, boom, right? He goes down. The entire gym goes ballistic. People are literally running around. They don't even know where they're going. They're just, they, they can't, they, they just can't believe what just happened. I'm like, I told you, I told you, I told you. And uh, the kid was down, not because he was knocked out, he was just so tired right. for like five minutes. And when he finally got up, I'm like, you wanna, you wanna try boxing? He, he laughs, he goes, nah, I'm good. Next thing I know, I see him on TV, like five years later, I see him on national TV mm. in a sport. He's playing a big sport, He's everybody knows him. And I'm like- You must have taught him something. Eh, 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 eh. But, but I mean, he was gonna be, he was a monster. But I'm saying, I taught my fighter. I said, you just, you just leveled the guy who weighed 100 pounds more than you and is seven inches taller than you only because you didn't implode like you normally do. Normally he would have, like I said, he couldn't even run the stairs because I was at the bottom talking. That diverted his attention, concentration so much. But with all those people there, I said, listen, man, you can't, you gotta, there's a lot, look at all these people. Like you can't punk up in front of all these people. Right. Right? Ever since then, he was a different guy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You, what, what type of cues are you looking for when you're working in the corner? Um, it's just posture, it's facial expression, it's, it's like when a guy throws a big combination, like I'll give you an example, Arthur. Arthur will sit down and throw four or five punches, then four or five more, like he'll, you know, two steady bursts. Right. When he's done, he's fine, like he looks, right? Now you see other guys, they may go crazy, but then when they finish, they, they step back and they, they right, melt. Right, right. And I go, he's, he's done. He's done. Like, he just, he just depleted himself 20%. Now, let's keep it going. Let's, let's engage him. Like, don't run from him. Let's engage him so he can deplete more. Then, once you get them depleted, they're like lambs. You know right. what I mean? You Do just go in want. and you slaughter them. You That's just it. get them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wow. You have to know what to look for. You have to know human reaction, you know, human posture. All these things you have to really pay close attention to. So somebody is sitting on a stool. Yeah, yeah. Are you looking over at the opponent? Yeah, yeah. Well, you look, you see a guy sit on a stool and he'll go, like, I, I see guys, Arthur. I always use Arthur. Arthur sits there. Next, you know, give me water, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You get other guys, they collapse. They <laughs> fall. Like, you remember when Klitschko fought, um, who did Klitsch go? Lennox Lewis. Right. And at one point, Lennox Lewis almost fell off the stool. Mm. I don't know if you remember that. He sat down and he, and here's why it happened, because he was so out of control of his body, he just wanted to sit anywhere. And he sat and he almost fell off the stool. Mm. He was, that's the big controversy that, that remains because they stopped the fight in his favor. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, you, you gotta let it go. Like, look at him, like Klitschko, Klitschko right. had the opportunity there and they didn't give Klitschko the chance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. think that fight would have gone differently had the fight went on? I think so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Based on what I saw, Lennox's collapse, you mm. know. Uh, and, you know, but he, but he won, you know, no disrespect to him. Yeah, yeah. Great champion. Right. He's an amazing guy. You know, but he, uh, that was a, that was a rough moment for him that they didn't get to let it play out. Right. You know? Right. So. I mean, he's, he's, uh, 
he had his time before that to just you know yeah be oh, the yeah man, yeah yeah so. I mean he was he's the you know he was it's not a career defining uh, you know yeah oh no his career was far better than that moment yeah. yeah he's he's a great fighter yeah there's nothing nothing negative on him I mean there's, you could say that for a lot of fighters you know Joe Frazier even Muhammad Ali there was moments you know where where uh, you know it wasn't perfect and uh, but you, you have to pay attention to these things and look for a, a kink in the armor right yeah is there something you do um, not not on a long-term basis maybe something like leading up to a fight um, to, to make to make your fighter you know like uh, I, I don't want to say more confident because I think all fighters are confident yeah but um, to make them really believe that you can win because a lot of a lot of times fighters will go into fights they don't really believe they can win but it's just when they're in there that well I've been doing this so long and right. then it's just autopilot right well I'll tell you I, and I mean this Arthur's the only guy that I really can say you don't have to do that with like you don't have to with most fighters there's a bit of psychology at play like like all of them you know like you have to play little games with them you have to do different things like plant seeds mm. you know just to be sure How, well, what type of seeds are you planting like, what are you saying you know like you might see you may see a guy and he's just a regular day of sparring right and they come back and go, man, you look strong, man. You look like a beast. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, man. And he'll go home and he's thinking about it. He goes, well, yeah, I did feel pretty good. You know, you know, yeah. I, did, I did feel good, you know, which he may not have. But you tell him he did, and that's, you know, the power of suggestion. You know, it's because a, a fighter's mind leading up to a fight is like Play-Doh. You know what Play-Doh is? Of course. You know, silly putty. Oh, I it's thought, like, you, meant, I thought you were talking thing. about Play-Doh, like Play-Doh the... No, Play-Doh. Right. Play-Doh. It's like silly putty. Yeah, yeah no, no, I know. You play with it, you, know, you mold it. A fighter is like that, and you can mold him. You can... I, I always... I've told this story once. Mm. Um, it's on YouTube somewhere. But I'll give an example. I had a fighter. I think I think I've seen it, but you I know hear. about you I know about this. Okay, I hear it. in Miami, was uh, okay. The, the protein powder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but please say. Okay, it. okay. So I had a fighter. He had a fight coming up. He was uh, he wasn't in good shape. It, it was a short notice thing, and I'm like, man, I got I got to do something to help him. But we only have a short time. And I said, you know what? So I got some. I had some protein powder, which, in reality on a one day basis does nothing. It would do zero, right? right? But he didn't know that. Might as well drink juice. Yeah, drink it and don't yeah. do anything. Just, you know, it doesn't yeah. make a difference. So I told him, I said, listen, you know, I'm, I'm like looking around. I said, I got this stuff, man. The doctor gave it to me. I said, I'm only gonna give you half of it because I don't want you to kill anybody. <laughs> but we're gonna take it. It's gonna give you all the energy you need. You know, I know you're not quite ready, but this is gonna give you what you need. You're gonna be fine. So he goes out. You know, looks like a million dollars. Mm. He's throwing punches, you know, he's going crazy. And he wins. So afterwards, he's like, oh, Scully got the stuff, man. He's got the stuff. He's telling everybody. He's telling everybody. But he goes, but he's like, and they're like, oh, what is it? He goes, no, no, no. I said, it's our secret. It's yeah. our secret. Right, Skull? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got this. So the next fight, I had to give it to him. Right. So I gave it to him like five fights in a row. Oh, he's hooked. So now he's like, he believes this, this powder is going to, you know, dominate the world. So we go to, <laughs> we go to Miami for a fight. And we're getting ready to go. We're leaving for the arena. And he's like, uh, you, you got stuff, right? And right away, I go, in my head, I'm like, I don't have it. I forgot, I left it home. And I go, yeah, yeah, I got to get it. It's in the car. Wait here, wait here. I, I, I panic. I go, what do I do? So I go. I'm on Miami Beach. I just run. Like, I just run. I just start running until I see something. I finally see uh, a mini mart. So I go in. And I remember I bought I bought a Red Bull, I bought a bottle of water, and I don't know why I bought some breath mints. <laughs> and I poured half the water out. I poured the, the the Red Bull in, and then I took the breath mints and I crushed them up right. into like powder. And I put them in. I shook it up, and I ran back to the hotel. I said, I got it. I got it. He drinks it, goes out, the fight of his life. <laughs> he's like he's like Superman, and he's like man. The stuff, you know, it works, it works. Yeah.
to this day, he does not know. That was that was 14 years ago. Mm. To this day, he does who, not who know. Who is that fighter? I can't. I can't, can't say. I can't okay, say. Okay. 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 Because somebody will tell him. Right. <laughs> you know? and, uh, I'll have to tell him one day. Uh, I don't think he watches. He doesn't watch the videos on the internet, so I don't have to worry. But, but my point is, I knew him. I knew what I could do. To, to reach his mind. Right. And it worked. Yeah. You know, whereas if I did that to someone else, if someone did that to me, I'd go, are you stupid? Uh, like, are you stupid? You really think that's going to work? Right. I wouldn't know it was going to work, but, but he didn't know about nutrition. He didn't know what it was, so he believed what I told him. And, right. and, and look, every trainer out there, whether they admit it or not, you have to lie sometimes. You, ha you can't tell your fighter, you look terrible. I know the fight's in two days, but you look terrible. Mm. You can't that be insane. You have right. to tell him he looks good, you know? So that's why before a fight, a reporter will call me two days before the fight. So how's he looking? What do you think I'm going to say? What, you, what kind of question is no, that? How does he like look? The yeah, on King. I think, I think we're going to lose. You know, we're, yeah, we're, yeah. we're really, he got knocked out the other day and he's got scar tissue. I mean, it's so, such a pointless question. Right. Every trainer in the world has to lie. They have to exaggerate. They have to. So that's the reality. Wow. <laughs> Man, that, that threw me off. I, uh, I, it's real. Like, I, you know, imagine Muhammad Ali went into the fight with Larry Holmes. He was a zombie. Hmm. He should not have been fighting, right? Now, if they ask Angelo Dundee two days before the fight, you know what he's going to say? He's looking like he did when he was champion. Yeah, he's, he's going to least looking yeah. like Cassius Clay. You'll see. You'll see. Right. You know, maybe maybe Larry Holmes would have believed it and been a little more apprehensive. Is right? there is there anything that you regret telling a fighter? Yeah. 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 Can you I, share? Or no? I uh, I had a fight, and and I've. Usually, my calculations are good. Mm -hmm. If, I, if I, I read the other fighter pretty well, and if I tell you he's weak, go get him. You can, you can bank on it, right? right? But I had a fight one time. Our opponent had to lose a lot of weight at the weigh-in. Mm -hmm. So I knew he was probably going to be drained and, and whatever. It was, it was an excess amount of weight. So my guy was winning, like he was looking good, but I knew he wasn't in top shape. Mm. I knew he wasn't, but he, he was the type of kid that, that fought off emotion. So he was, you know, you, he could suck it up and, right. and do it. angry and. Yeah, you know, you know, everything. He just had that in him. So we're winning. We were winning the fight. All we had to do was, was get through the last two rounds. And, but I was worried because I said, you know, it's getting the later rounds and he knows that. Mind plays tricks on you. And I thought he might be fading, but the other guy had lost a ton of weight. And I knew he was suffering. So I said, man, we gotta, we gotta get him. Right. You know, push him, push him, let's get him out of there. Let's get him out of there. And my guy, and I don't know if this would happen anyway or not, but probably not. Uh, so my guy pushed it more. He got Gets caught, caught way in. and he got stopped. Mm. So we would have won the fight if I would have told him. But now I'm not 100 percent sure he would have yeah. been able to. That's the game. So, you know, That's I wasn't sure. I, I was afraid that he didn't have the energy to box because the other guy was going to come on strong. And you know, and I said, uh, you know, I could have told him run, run, run for the last two rounds because we're way ahead. Mm -hmm. But I was I was afraid he didn't have it in him. Right. And I thought, knowing his personality, I thought it would be better to tell him. Go get him. Like, let's take him out. And it backfired. That Honestly, though, in my entire career, that's the only time I can think of where I gave really verifiably bad advice. Mm. That was That's the only time it really stands out to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know about verifiable, but... Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it may have happened anyway, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, I... I, I you know, looking back, I wish I would have told him, you know, box. Let's just get, get through the last two rounds. Just box. Because we were ahead anyway. Yeah. You know, so I, I miscalculated on that. You know, one. knowing everything you know now, yeah. uh, you've been in boxing for, you know, longer than I've been around, <laughs> right? Um, what would, would, is there anything you'd change in your career? Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I would, and this is a whole deeper subject, but I had fights I went into losing weight for mm -hmm. in you know back then we didn't know how to lose weight right. we didn't have strength codes nutrition like we just we starved ourselves we didn't eat mm -hmm. we ran in rubber suits we did all the most insane stupid things and i had fights i went into 
that the last place on earth I should have been was a boxing ring. Mm. There's no chance I should have been in there. And I was fighting high level, you know, guys, number yeah. two ranked world champion, the whole nine. Uh, I went into a fight and I, and I won this fight, but I don't know how, but I went into the fight where I almost passed out on the way to the ring. We were waiting in the back room and I had, I was, I was really drained. And at one point I, I kind of like, I felt like I lost consciousness and I fell and, I, and hitting the wall woke me up. I said, man, man, I told the trainer, uh, put the water bucket underneath me because I might throw up into it, right? I ended up winning the fight. They let you fight. They didn't, yeah, you know, like I didn't say, no, I didn't tell them. Okay. Right. I, didn't, I never told, that's one thing, another thing, I never told anyone. I could have got hit by a bus. I wouldn't have told my trainer, mm -hmm. never. So I never told them any issues I had, but like I said, I won that fight, but uh, it took like five rounds for me to, the adrenaline to kick in and you know, and I, I, I persevered, but other fights, I went into fights knowing I was going to lose, knowing there was no chance I could win this fight because I had just lost one fight. I lost nine and a half pounds the night before the weigh-in. You know, I, I was nine and a half pounds over. I got, and I've already been losing weight right, for right, months. Right. And that particular fight, the guy, my friend, told me after he he knocked on my door the morning of the fight. I opened the door. Your trainer. My friend. Okay. He hadn't seen me in months. I opened the door and I remember he gasped. He went, and I went, what? And he goes, oh, nothing, man. He told me after. He said, man. You were, <laughs> he said, you were, face. no, he said, you were green. He said, your skin was green and you looked emaciated. Right. And, but right then, I didn't know exactly what he meant, but, but when I saw his face, I said, man, he Must knows. Have been bad. He yeah. knows. Like, I already knew subconsciously, but he verified it for me. Right. He, he it. at the last minute, like the fights that night, and he verified. I'm going to get killed tonight at about nine o'clock. <laughs> you know? So, I uh, that fight I wouldn't have fought. If I could go back and do it over, I would. I would. I would. I would walk out of the dressing room or the hotel. I would have just walked out. I said, Look, I'm not fighting. I'm going to get killed. I'm not ready. Yeah. Just this is pointless. Did you get hurt? No, no, no. One thing about me, I always had good defense. Right. So, if I was depleted. I could still catch the shots. And, right, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these guys, like, boxing is a crazy game, right? I appreciate people like Arturo Gatti, who, fighting De La Hoya, fighting, didn't, fighting didn't Mayweather, but he yeah. knew, he knew that if, they, if he had to bet, he would have bet against himself. Mm -hmm. He would have still tried, yeah. but he would have bet. He knew he couldn't beat these. He knew there was no chance, yeah, the Floyd fight, but he tried, the, yeah. and he voluntarily allowed himself to get smashed mm -hmm. and, you know, and hurt. He got yeah. hurt. You know? And me, if I knew, it was almost like I, have a, I had a funny mindset, and I always did everything on my own. I never confided in anyone. Not my trainers, not my best friend. I always did it with myself. So it was almost like boxing was a was a was a person, mm. and boxing was trying to get me. Boxing was trying to trick me and say, "Come on, fight, fight while you're not ready." So in my mind, I would say, eh, "I'll fight, but I'm I'm not risking it. I'm not gonna, you know." In two fights I had, I didn't push with everything I had because I knew. I said, man, I end up like Gerald McClellan. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna, I know I can't win. I know right. I'm, I'm just depleted. And I literally, and after, after this one particular fight, they interviewed me on ESPN in the ring. And I said, I quit. And they're like, whoa, are you retiring? I said, no, I quit. I hate boxing. I hate this game. I hate, there was three times in my career, I hated boxing. I mean, hated boxing. And all three times were after, losing fights where I was so depleted and, and, and in fights where I said, man, I, I would have beat this guy. I really feel I would have won if I didn't have to make weight in the manner that I did. But I can't tell people that because right. they go, ah, I saw the fight, you got yeah, beat. Yeah. I said, man, but fighters understand. I'm like, man, I, I'm telling you. I, and if I didn't win, I would have put up a much greater effort. But I did it because that's what you do. You fight anyway, you know, you're a fighter. How, how do you avoid putting yourself in this, this type of situation? Well, one thing, like I said, I made a mistake. I never confided in anyone. Mm. But, and I'll, tell you, and I'll tell you one reason why. 
The night before the fight where I, I told you on the way to the ring, I almost passed out. The night before the fight at midnight, after midnight, I was sick to my stomach. I called my sparring partner. I said, Mike, come here, man, come here, come here, come here. Man, go tell the manager, tell him, tell him I'm sick. So I figure he's gonna come in, he's gonna say, I'm laying on the bathroom floor, right? Like, I, right. I can't even get up. <clears throat> the guy comes back, the fighter comes back. He said, oh, just, he said, just go to sleep and you'll be all right in the morning. And I'm, and I'm, I'm laying there on the floor and I'm like, he's not gonna come? Like, he's not even gonna come check on me? Like, right. this is my guy? This is the guy looking out for my career? And, uh, and I fought. And that's the only time I fought depleted like that where I won. I actually won, the, which, which one of the best guys I've fought in my career. It was a big win. Mm -hmm. I never should have fought. I would, if it, and if that was me, if I was the trainer, I wouldn't have, I'm, I'm laying on the floor. Right, midnight. Gonna let you fight. No, I'm not gonna let you fight. But he didn't even come and check on me. So I realized then I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. I gotta make my own decisions. And uh, you know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, you mentioned that when you trained with Russ, yeah, um, you had like a different, you know, you, the, the, the fight were just the fights were a lot yeah, more yeah, smooth. Yeah. The training camps well, were a lot more smooth. It wasn't just the, the corner on fight night. That was my last fight. I was, I won my last fight over a good opponent. I was going to keep boxing. Mm -hmm. What happened was that's another story. But over the next year and a half, nine different fights of mine fell out for different mm -hmm. reasons. And I started training a fighter in the meantime, and and I just continued with that. I, I let it go. Right. Uh, but with Russ, he was the first guy. We're talking about Russ Amber, by the Russ way. Russ Amber, Russ Amber, Rival Products. Yes, sir. <laughs> the best boxing products in the game. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But Russ was very smooth in the corner. He was very, as we trained, and we only trained a short time. I came okay. to Montreal, then we went to Toronto. I trained for a short time. But, um, so basically I trained myself mm -hmm. for the fight. But, you know, the way he would give instructions in the gym, and I said, man, this is the guy, I should have had this guy my whole career. career. And I knew, Robert, you know, he lives in Montreal, I live, you know, it's not that easy. But the night of the fight, it was so smooth, and I remember saying, it's a new beginning, mm. and I'm gonna have Russ train me from now on, and this is gonna be great, but then, Fights fell out, and I just let it go. But mm. Russ was a—it uh, was a—it no, was a noticeable difference between other corners and other preparation. He talked to me like, like a world-class fighter. Okay. We we talked on the same level, where other trainers, who I had a million times more experience than, would talk to me like they were my teacher and I'm their student and I'm not going to tell them anything about what needs to be done. Right. So I had no input. Where me and Russ were like, well, what do you think about this? And I, yeah, but dude, yeah, yeah, that's good, you know. Okay. So we were a team. And, uh, you speak the same language. 100%, 100%, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But look, uh, there's, actually, there's one last question if you have. Yeah, yeah. Can we, do we, yeah? All right, awesome. So um, I, I spoke to you about this before we started filming. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked you, why are you know the older generation like Russ, Otis, Howard, yourself? Yeah. They're very pessimistic when they're talking when they talk about boxing. Yeah. Um, how has boxing changed? You know, I'm, I'm 23. I've only seen what I've seen, right? Right, right, right. I haven't seen. I don't know the difference between you know when Hagler and Hearns and all those right, guys were right, fighting. Right. Well, how has it changed? Like, I, I, and I we we touched on this earlier off camera. Um, as an example, see. And I'll preface that by saying this. If you have 10 fights, like I'll give you an example. Cl Clarissa Shields is whatever weight she's at, I don't know what weight she is, but she's the best in her weight, mm -hmm. right? She's the best in the world. That's impressive in the world. But there's only like 23 girls in the whole world in her weight. Right. So she's the best of 23, which is cool, but it's a little misleading when you realize that, you know, Arthur's the best of you know, 840 guys, you know what I mean? Right. So the talent pool is different. So being the best in this era might not be the same. And, and, and I can prove that with two things. One, I read a thing, and, and I know it's true. You can tell by the ring record book mm -hmm. volumes. There are more fighters. There were more fighters in New York City in 1950 than there are right now in the entire United States of America. Think about that, one city had more fighters than the whole country, 50 states, and we're talking about just one city. And I can verify that by this, as I told you earlier. 
say for example between the year 1985 and 1987 in Hartford I was a, I was a 165 pound amateur so if I needed sparring there was four gyms I could go to I had my pick of probably and I could name some of them Nick Mejia Robert Murray Marlon Starlin, Troy Werther, Michael Bell, Adam Hellerman, Brian Sims, Marcus Jackson, Tyrone Bulls, Edward Rodriguez, Jesus Manzon, Mohamed Shabazz. Mm. Those are guys I could spar with any time I want. Does that have to do with MMA? Like a lot of fighters are becoming MMA fighters now? Nah, in Hartford, there's no MMA. Okay. There's no guys. But now, so, in, so from 1985 to 1987, if I needed sparring, I could go to those guys I just named and 20 more. Today, there's only one kid, and he's and he's one he's a light heavyweight. So so 165, 156, 147 in Hartford. There's no one, zero. So boxing's not as good because there's nobody there's, there. There's, there's no fights. fighters. There's no fighters. We haven't had a pro fight in Hartford in in years. Mm. Years back in the day, there was fights in Hartford twice a month. Pro fights. You know there was when when I started boxing, there was four gyms. They had a, a series at an, at an event center there called um, uh, Battle of the Hartford Gyms. They would have one gym fight one gym. So it's just two gyms. Now if you do an amateur show, you gotta go to the whole region. Yeah, you gotta go, right. We did one gym against one gym, 12 fights. Really? We could match up guys. It was Battle of the Hartford Gym. It was Bellevue Square versus Universal Life. Universal Life versus Charter Oak. Charter Oak versus Bellevue Square, right? Now, you so couldn't, you it couldn't means do, a lot more to win a title. You could barely time. do that in the whole state. Mm. Could you find 12 guys to match up, you know, on one show uh, in, in, in each weight class, 106, 112, 119, you know what I mean? Yeah. We did that every two months they did that back in the day. So if you win, like a guy will say, oh, I'm a six-time Golden Glove champion. Yeah, well, that's because you had to fight one fight. Right, you, bit two, you had to fight guys. five fights. Mark right. Breland, to win New York City, not national, to win New York City, he had to fight six fights mm. in like 1982, I think it was. Six fights just to win the New York City Golden Gloves. You know what I mean? That mean you know how many guys in, in New York City there were? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's unfathomable compared to today. So the talent pool is not there. So the fighter, you're going to have good fight. There's good fighters. Errol Spence is a good fighter. Crawford's a good fighter. They're all good. Arthur's good. But back in the day, there was a lot of good fighters. Mm. You know, there was, you know, middleweights, like, like I told you earlier, off camera. I said, back in, from 1985 to 1987, at middleweight, you had... Marvin Hagler, Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns, Michael Nunn, Frank Tate, Iran Barkley, Robbie Sims, Murray Sutherland, Frank Fletcher, James Schuler, and I can name 20 other guys. Right. Today, 2022, the top 10 middleweights, the only one I can name, and I was just reading about him the other day, like Charlo. Charlo's right. a middleweight. Right. I just told you about Charlo. Oh, you told me, okay. <laughs> I can't, I couldn't name three middleweights in the world right now. I have no idea. Because mm. cause boxing's not on the front page. It's not big like it was. It's a big sport, but it, there's too much stuff going on. Is this still possible for a fighter to turn pro and go the, the tradition, traditional route, you know, take a couple fights on the road and then, you know, build a career? Or, or are we officially in the Instagram era? And, and Because like you said, we're not on the front page anymore, right? Right. It's, it's, it's tough because, it, like I said, there's no shows. Because fighter, I remember my manager telling me, he said, doing local shows is a losing proposition. Mm. You're going to lose money. The only reason you do local shows is to build up your fighters so that they can get signed or you know move on to bigger fights. Right. It's an investment. Nowadays, guys do a show, they lose $6,000 and they don't do any more shows. Yeah, sure. you know, they want other people to put their guy on. So the, the, the era of local shows is gone. Mm. It's, and, and that's why every era thinks their era was the best. Right. But I'm telling you, if anyone from this era is going to tell me this era is better than my era, they're either ignorant or they just got too much pride or they, they just don't know any better. Mm. They have no idea. They have no clue. And my era was better, period. And the era before mine, back in the day, like, in the, you know, people see James Tony and Floyd Mayweather do the shoulder roll. Mm -hmm. 
and it's like a magic trick. Everybody's like, man, everybody's trying to do the James Tony right. Floyd. Man. Everybody did it in 1950. Everybody did it back then. Hurricane, watch tapes of Hurricane Carter, Joey Giardello, Archie Moore, Ezra Charles. I, I, I definitely, I definitely watch, see Archie Moore. Watch them. They've all done it. They all did it. The shoulder roll was like the jab. Everybody did the shoulder roll. Now two guys do it, and everybody thinks it's so special. Right. You're not special, man. You're unusual because nobody's doing it. That's not a good thing. It's not a good thing that people don't know how to do the shoulder roll. It just proves that nobody knows how to teach it. Nobody is teaching it because nobody heard of it. Because it died off. You know what they say? All the old trainers died off. Angel Dundee, Emmanuel Stewart. Yeah. They're, they're all gone. That and the new guys. Sense, yeah. I see people, it's it's embarrassing. And I look, and they may be, you know, like people are gonna watch this and be mad at me because it's them I'm talking about. Okay. But you may be a great person, and hey, how you doing? But it is what it is. If your name on Instagram is the Mitt Master. Pad Master. Yeah. Pad Master. <laughs> the Mythologist. I already know you don't shit. know boxing. Yeah. I already know. Yeah. When I see people do the Mayweather pad work, and everybody wants to do it. Women, housewives want to do the, pay, the right. Mayweather power. Fighters want to do it. I go, why? Floyd Mayweather does it. Why? You can't even tell me. Do you think Floyd Mayweather was one of the greatest fighters of all time because he did that pad work? No. Do you think that had anything to do no, with that it? That pad work's for sure. It's nonsense. Listen, if you taught a kid from day one and that's all you showed him, you, he Couldn't wouldn't box. win a fight. He would right. get obliterated. It would be ridiculous. It would be embarrassing. Yeah, but the, the shoulder roll is completely overused on the pads. Yeah, completely yeah, yeah. overused. Look at a man. Watch. I challenge anyone. Go watch Emmanuel Stewart on video. Do the pads with Gerald McClellan, Tommy Hearns. That's how you do pads. Mm -hmm. Pad work. I, I give it. It's, it's this is the perfect illustration of how stupid our society is today. I did pads with Chad Dawson on video with Ellie Secback. Ellie Secback put the video up before we fought Hopkins the first time. So, you know, we're doing the pads and, uh, and I'm telling her, all right, do this. And, you know, and, all right, I'd step in a little more. You know. Some guys, they commented on it and they said, ah, it's okay, but, you know, the trainer keeps talking too much. You know, we want to see the pad work. And I go, listen. I'm not doing this for your entertainment. This right. isn't for you. Yeah, this is for him. Watch fight you're watching us. I'm doing it for him yeah. to help him win the fight. I'm not doing it to amuse you. That's not what bo boxing training is boring to watch. If I have to it's jazz repetitive, it up, it's simple. right? If it's, I have to yeah. jazz it up, that means I'm an Instagram trainer. Right. And I don't want an Instagram trainer teaching my son. But here's what's happening: people are going on Instagram, going, "Oh, look at this guy doing the pads." Let's get him. His gym's only 10 miles from here. Right. And they got their kid training with this guy who, other than the flashy pad work, couldn't teach a dog to bark. Mm. You know what I mean? It's embarrassing. It's crazy. I mean, so like I say, when I see someone doing that. How do you tell the how difference? Do you know? How does the, the guy watching at home tell the difference between the padologist and, you know, well, and the guy that can really if you're not it? Floyd Mayweather, then, I mean, here's, here's what you do. Go on Instagram and find the guys who are mythologists and pad master and all this stuff, right? And then find out who they trained. Mm. And let's see. Okay. Did they train the current undisputed champion of the world? Or did they train Gladys from Kmart mm. <laughs> that wants to work out three times a week? You know, okay. it's just it's just ridiculous. I mean I mean it's not why would you teach someone to punch in a manner that they would never do in a real fight and if they did they would get killed right like you know you see fighters do the pad work and they you know uh, uh, right you throw the right, hook right, this soft right, right? Uh, and they go yeah. well when keith thurman throws the left hook you're not blocking Sits it with down. this yeah you're not going to flick your hand up and and Keith, his glove is going to go through the, his, his glove is going to go through your glove, and your glove is going to hit your face, and your head's going to knock sideways, That's it. and you're going to be asleep because you thought, based on this guy's pad work, that I could block it with this. Right. <laughs> it's, it's in, like it's embarrassing yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. No, I I, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, look, there's a there's a game I play with all my guests. All right. Um, so I'm going to name fighters. Well, actually. I'm gonna name coaches actually. Okay. And uh, you're gonna describe them all with one word or one sentence. Okay. All right. Let me find that page. I wrote down a bunch of names. All right. Russ Amber. V 
very involved, hands-on, technical, cares about the fighter. Otis Grant. Great guy, has a wealth of knowledge, you know, super, super experienced. Howard Grant. Same thing, him and, him and Howard Otis are the same. Mark Ramsey. Very, very involved in every aspect of training. Freddie Roach. Freddie Roach is, is great on the pads. He's, he's similar, like he's, he's, he watches the films. He's, he's, he's in he's a trainer, he's focusing on you. Teddy Atlas. I think, <laughs> I, th <laughs> I think Teddy's a good trainer for certain people. And realistically, most people are not those people. Okay. You know what I mean? He talks to you in a way like he's, he's God. Yeah. And he's teaching you life lessons. Mm -hmm. Everybody doesn't need life lessons. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need boxing and, and we need you to talk to me like a man. Okay. I think he makes a mistake sometimes. It's degrading sometimes. He degrades right? you sometimes. Yeah. He, he's, he's putting himself up here and you know, he's supposed to be a little more equal. Right, and Manuel yeah. Stewart. Yeah. That's your the, idol. The, the ultimate pad guy. Like, he's the pad master. Yeah. And he does it right. And he understands that you hit the pads like you fight. A man you stood. Watch a man you stood. Buddy, Buddy McGrath. Buddy's a genius. You know, he's, he's, he's a, one of the best technical fighters we've ever seen. A very, very smart boxing brain. Virgil Hunter. <clears throat> Virgil Hunter, sorry. Virgil Hunter, I. I uh, I think psychologically, I think he's very sharp. When we were fighting him with Chad Dawson, I picked up on things he I said. Against Andre Ward? Yeah, against Andre Ward. Yeah. And when I picked up on things he said and did, and I said, this guy's sharp. Like, he's, yeah. he's, he's, a, he's a manipulator. Maybe with a senior. Ah, I think, I think he knows boxing, but he, I think the, the style he teaches, it is what it is. It's the only style he teaches. Okay. There's one style. You cannot teach a six foot two, you know, white guy with bulk how to fight like Mayweather. Right, right. But that's what he does. Robert Garcia. Um, I honestly don't know that much about him. I know, I know he's had good fighters. You know, he, he must be he must be pretty good. I, he taught his younger brother. And yeah, yeah, his, younger his brother, brother was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, look, at that three level, world titles. at that level, and, and they're proof of something. Like everybody at a level, a certain level, is good for certain people. Right. You know, I've had people I trained that I connected with so deeply that I could tell them anything and they're gonna listen. Where I had other guys and they'd be like, "Yeah, but what about?" And I'm like, "Ah, see, you're 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 offering resistance. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not used to me and you're not used to this." And you know, it's like a marriage. Some people, you know, they may be the prettiest girl on earth. But she smokes cigarettes. Mm. You can't get past that. <laughs> we can't. We can't relate. You know what I mean? So, so being the best trainer. People say, "Who's the best trainer?" I go, "It's it's, it's an unanswerable question. It depends on the fighter. Right? For who? In, in relation to him. Who? You know, Freddie's the best trainer for some people. Floyd's the best trainer for some people. I'm the best trainer for some people. Mm -hmm. Mark Ramsey's the best trainer for some some people. Not everybody, but some of them. How do you know that you? You have a good trainer for yourself. You know, if you if he makes you feel like a fighter, mm. if he makes you feel like you belong there, you know, you know, some guys, and I hate this, and I really hate this. I see trainers, and and it is what it is. They'll be mad at this too. <laughs> some trainers either weren't fighters, or they were terrible as fighters, or they just didn't accomplish anything. And I find those are the ones that are the most aggressive. Like mm. they want to compensate. And they, right. they yell at the fighter, yeah. and they like they'll, they'll especially when they do this with kids. And a kid will do something, you know. All right, throw the jab, right hand, left hook, and then step out. The kid doesn't do it right, and the trainer will literally be mad. Yeah. And he will yell at the kid. I'm saying. That guy was not a fighter. He sucked as I, a fighter. I always say this. Yeah. Boxing's hard as, as it is. Right. For you to be a coach and make it even harder yeah. is way worse. Right. But you're trying to, I believe, I'm big on the psychology. I believe, and they'll be mad, but they can, they can be mad at themselves. When a trainer, if I tell you to do something and you can't get it, and I instinct, my reaction is to yell at you and embarrass you. I'm talking about me. I'm yelling at me. 
I'm yelling at myself because I sucked 20 years ago. Mm. I couldn't do it 20 years ago. And I want you to do it because if I teach you to do it, somehow that'll compensate for me not being able right. to do it. It's, it's psychological. Mm -hmm. And so when I see trainers, if I'm in a gym and I, if I had a son and I'm bringing him to the gym and I see the trainer yell at the guy for not being able to do something, I walk right out. I don't care what he says or does or who he's trained, I walk right out. Because mm -hmm. I know he's he's got his own issues to work out. There's a way of doing it. Yeah, for sure. I see. Well, I, I don't want this to, you know, to be over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I really appreciate your time. That was good, Thank man. you so much it was for coming fun. on. It was fun. I really, really appreciate your time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. No, I appreciate Thanks yours. So Thank you. I've completely forgot my outro, but it's okay. Um, that's it, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope it was a good investment every time. Follow my man, uh, Iceman John Scully. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. Subscribe to mine. Check out my Patreon. And peace.